I left OTS never to return. Once Reg and I called it quits, so did Atlantic. They quickly dropped us from the label. I left 8-Ball and MJG behind so they could get their shot at a record deal and also warned them about how Reg handled funds. After being gone for a month or two, I found out through a friend that Reg and 8-Ball recorded a disc record about me. I immediately went on the counter-attack and released a reply titled, Bass in Your Face. I left Ball there because I felt like he could get more done there than he could with me because I got to go search for a new situation. I didn't want to take him through that. So I left him there. But then a friend of mine called me a few weeks later and said, hey man, they got a song about you. You know, and I'm like, who is they? He was like, Eight Ball and Reginald. And I'm like, I'm thinking in my head, why would Eight Ball side with Reginald and diss me when I'm the one pulled them in? So my friend let me hear this record over the phone because I didn't believe him. So once I heard Reg on there talking and I heard Ball rapping, you know, I know metaphors, man. It was a diss. It was a diss record coming from both of them, you know. So I immediately retaliated and I cut bass in your face. You know what I'm saying? And I attacked A Ball. Reg wasn't no rapper. So it wasn't no sense in me attacking him because people didn't really know who he was as no rapper. Since that day, me and Eight Ball have been distant. One day, while at home writing music, I received a call from Atlanta based Power Records CEO Leroy McMath. He offered me a deal with Power Ichiban, and I accepted and quickly relocated to Stone Mountain, Georgia. At the time, MC Breed was also signed with Power Ichiban, and I immediately started touring with Breed. I recorded three albums under the Power Records imprint, All About Coming Up, Sex, Money and Murder, and Deadly Verses. While I was out of town promoting the album, an enemy that I never saw coming was attacking me from the blind side. A local rap group by the name of 3-6 Mafia was quickly gaining a reputation for themselves by dissing other well-known artists, including myself and Bone Thugs and Harmony. I never responded to any of the verbal assaults because I knew what they were trying to accomplish. During that time, there were so many other problems that the beef with 3-6 would have to be postponed. My relationship with Power Records was beginning to sour and as time went by I found myself in the same position I was in when I was with OTS. I recorded one last album with Power Records entitled Homicidal Lifestyle. After ending my stint with Power I relocated back to Memphis. I started my own label and called it Red Rum Records. I took it through Selecto Hits for distribution. My first release on my own label was titled The Story of My Life. Later that year, the beef with 3-6 Mafia began to spiral out of control. One incident in particular took place at a recording studio in Memphis called Arden. It involved Juicy J, myself, and my longtime friend Mac 10. I tried to ignore the three six mafia disses. You know, they was all in the murder dog magazine saying some negative stuff about me. I tried to ignore it. You know. But uh I just got tired of hearing their mouth, man, so I went on and put the Tether Club down record out. You know, it went from Tether Club up to Tether Club down. And it was a straight diss. I called their names, I let them know who I was talking about. You know, whatever y'all want to do behind that is cool with me. If, if I wanted to do something to them, I could have. If they wanted to do something to me, they could have. I don't think it was ever that serious. I think it was just, just a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of he say, she say, a lot of third party talk, you know. But uh, if they wanted to sit down and squash them and squash it and work together on some stuff, you know, I'm all for that. If they want to keep the honor, keep the distance, that's cool with me too. However you want it, we can do it, man. I ain't got no problem with that. I ain't even got no beef with them no more. I ain't even thinking like that no more. You know what I'm saying? The year after that, I released Show Your Grill. While out one night promoting the single, I stopped by a local strip club called Ebony Lace. I met a stripper that would change the direction of my life and my profession. 
I went to the strip club to promote my record, and I met this little chick up in there, man, you know. She was talking about how, you know, how, how, how much she was on my music and stuff like that, so, you know, we started kicking it, man, you know. And uh, she was searching for somebody, you know, she, she liked pimps. You know what I'm saying? But she didn't want to be with a pimp because she didn't want to be up under no rules and regulations. And uh, so we started kicking it, man. And, you know, her auntie was sprung, so her auntie was stealing her money. So she asked me to hold her money for her. You know what I'm saying? So I got her, I think she gave me like 600. So I put it in my drawer and never touched it. You know, so a couple of nights went by and I reminded her, I said, hey, you know, I still got your money. You know, I ain't touched none of it. I ain't spent a dime of it. Whatever you needed is there for you. And she was like, oh, I ain't studying that money, you know, and pulled out another big bank roll and, and handed that to me. She was like, hold it. And I'm like, wow, now I got about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 of this chick's money, you know what I'm saying? And uh, she ain't even sweating it, you know. So uh, I didn't really pick up on it, man, until, you know what I'm saying, we was hanging out and, uh, you know, she was friends with this other chick who had a pimp. And you know, by them being cool, we all hooked up and me and the pimp got to talking, you know? And he was letting me know that, hey man, even though you don't consider yourself no pimp, you still in the pimp's position because you with a woman, you know what I'm saying, that's selling her body, man. And she, you know, when you out with her, you know what I'm saying, she depending on you to have her back. So that automatically puts you in a pimp's position. You know what I mean? So you facing the same dangers that a regular pimp faces anyway. You know what I'm saying? So he schooled me on a lot of knowledge, man, and uh, gave me the game, and I really put some thought to it, you know, because uh, I seen she was, you know, she was down for me. The pressures from both the rap game and the pimp game began to clash, and it brought me to the crossroads. The choice that I made would change me forever. You know, I pimped for about six years strong, man, and, you know, I walked away from it, man. I walked away from it, but it left me mentally scarred for life because it's hard for me to function with a regular square woman, man. And when I say square, I mean a woman that don't sell her body or nothing like that. It's hard for me to function with them because I'm used to pimping, man. So, you know, I'm having trouble readjusting. You know, I don't know if I could even live a square life again, you know. I hadn't had a girlfriend since 1995. I relocated to Detroit, Michigan for a short time. After that, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. I ended up back in Atlanta, Georgia after six years in the pimp game. I signed with an Atlanta-based management company called Lampkin International, who at the time managed R&B songstress Nivea and Carolina's bad boy, P.D. Pablo. I recorded the album The Dro, featuring David Banner and a host of others. Due to creative differences, I fired Lampkin International as management. I left there and relocated back to Memphis, Tennessee, desperately in need of a fresh start. So I left Atlanta, came back to Memphis, man, and uh, came back for a fresh new start, man. And this go round, man, it's, it's gonna be right, man. It's gonna be right, man. You know, I'm back me again. I ain't, I ain't pimping right now. I'm strictly focused on music. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm definitely getting ready to restructure Memphis music once again, you know. I started it, and I'm definitely gonna finish it, man, you know.